a heartfelt welcome to all of you who have chosen to worship with us today. I hope this is genuinely a time for Sabbath rest, renewal, and reflection. Won't you be called to worship? Come, you who are weary of wealth, of poverty, of power, of struggle, of division. Come, all you who are heavy laden with too much, with too little, with anxiety, with fear, with anger. Come, all who have hope for liberation, for peace, for freedom, for the kingdom. Hear these words. See, I am making all things new. Let us worship God. Friends, today I'm sharing a word from our spirituality room, number 210, in our faith formation wing. It is a good place that you should stow away in your memory to come and pray and reflect. I'm next to this beautiful cross that was created by uh, Carl Sokolowski as part of our experiences together through living Bible and in worship, making use of the symbol of Celtic knots, a sign of God's steadfast love that is spread across this cross. And of course, there's an empty uh, cross because the cloth is symbolic of the fact that Jesus could not be contained by death. We are reflecting today on the story of Joseph and his brothers. And of course, bad things happen. You'll learn more about that in our reading and meditation. But we worship a God whose love is stronger than even death itself. And though we may go on a winding path through life, Though we may stumble, though we may sin, as this labyrinth helps us reflect upon these turning moments in our life, 
like the labyrinth beyond these windows at our outdoor labyrinth where you still can go today and travel and pray. Though we have these twists and turns, the steadfast love of God is constant. And so we know if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But we worship a God who is faithful to the character of love. Let us now join our hearts in the prayer of confession. I'm going to read a prayer uh, offered by the Church of Scotland. Let us pray. Merciful God, you care for each of us and for our happiness. And when we turn from you and hurt one another, your heart is grieved. For our lack of understanding and for the bitterness we often feel, for our forgetfulness and neglect of others, and for the suffering we cause, for our failure to forgive. We seek your pardon, O oh God. We thank you for the assurance you've given us in Jesus, that you accept us as we are and are ready to forgive us. Fulfill that promise for us now that we may be released from past failure. That we may venture into a new beginning through Jesus Christ. Hear now our individual prayers of confession in the silence of this moment. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy upon us. Amen. Well, friends, hear the good news. Who is in any position to condemn? Only Christ Jesus. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us and knows us so well as even to pray for us. Anyone who is in Jesus Christ becomes a brand new creation. The old life, it is past and gone, and the new life, it begins in the here and now. So let us believe God's promises, believe in God's transforming power for the world and for your life and mine as well. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Friends, there are so many people who are feeling socially isolated and just hungering for a word of kindness, for a word of peace. Now is your opportunity to share that peace of Christ. It may be somebody sitting right next to you on the sofa, and it may be somebody you need to send an email or a text to. Let us share the peace of Christ.
won't you join your hearts together with mine in prayer? As we hear your word, speak with authority to our lives, O oh God. Speak to us and to what is in us and to what in us needs to change that we might be whole. Speak to us with love, with hope, and with strength so that we might hear you and know deep inside that we are your people and you are our God. By the power of the Holy Spirit, let it be so. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis, its final chapter, chapter 50, verses 15 to 21. Listen now for God's word. When Joseph's brothers realized that their father was now dead, they said, What if Joseph bears a grudge against us and wants to pay us back seriously for all the terrible things we did to him? So they approached Joseph and said, your father gave orders before he died, telling us, This is what you should say to Joseph. Please forgive your brother's sins and misdeeds, for they did terrible things to you. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of your father's God. Joseph went, wept when they spoke to him. His brothers wept too, fell down in front of him and said, We're here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I God? You planned something bad for me, but God produced something good from it. In order to save the lives of many people, just as he's doing today. Now don't be afraid. I will take care of you and your children. So he put them at ease and spoke reassuringly to them. Here ends our first reading from Holy Scripture.
And now we continue our scripture readings for today, turning now to the book of Romans, the eighth chapter. Listen again for the word of the Lord. All around us, we observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pangs. But it's not only around us, it's within us. The Spirit of God is arousing us within. We're also feeling the birth pangs. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. That is why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We are enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't see what is enlarging us. But the longer we wait, the larger we become and the more joyful our expectancy. Meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside us, helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves knows our pregnant condition, and keeps us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. Here ends our reading. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Growing up, my family wasn't exactly a road trip kind of family, at least in part because I was a terrible passenger. You could always count on me to get car sick in the first 15 minutes of any trip. But one frequent road trip destination of my childhood was my dad's hometown, Dixon, Illinois, about 100 miles west of Chicago. And on one of those trips out to Dixon, when I was probably six or seven years old, I can distinctly remember sitting in the back seat of our Toyota Camry when I was suddenly struck with a deep sense of awe. And in that moment, I called up to my dad in the front seat and asked, Dad, how do you know where you're going? I didn't get it. He didn't have a map. And to me, there seemed to be hundreds, thousands of potential turns along the way. And somehow, some way, he just knew which to take. He was, I concluded then, a genius. And I became determined that one day I would live into my father's navigational prowess. Well, by the time I was old enough to drive, two things had happened. First, I came to realize that it's not that complicated to follow I-88 pretty much all the way to Dixon. And second, the GPS had become ubiquitous. Instead of studying a route ahead of time, consulting maps or memorizing street names and landmarks, I just punched in my destination and followed the turn-by-turn -turn directions. But the thing is, even with a GPS, occasionally you make a wrong turn. And that's when perhaps the most remarkable feature of this most remarkable device springs into action. Recalculating. Continue 0.7 miles, then turn right onto I-40 East. Amazing, right? Automatic route recalculation. Even though it was my mistake taking that wrong turn, the GPS saves me. And it always gets me to my destination, even if it's by a different route than the one originally planned. 
While you may share my deep appreciation for the GPS and wish that I just continue on extolling the virtues of this technology, I do feel some obligation to talk about the story of Joseph and his brothers. But I promise, fellow GPS lovers, I will circle back. Our reading from Genesis this morning is from the very end of this sprawling epic of Joseph that spans 14 chapters. And in order to understand these six verses we read today more fully, we really need to recap how Joseph and his brothers arrived here. When they were growing up, the worst kept secret in the family was that Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. He even gives him a coat of many colors, remember? Parents, I know that we all have a favorite kid, but I encourage you to refrain from telling your other kids that they're not it. When Joseph was 17, he shares a pair of dreams in which his brothers and his parents bow down to him. As you can imagine, this didn't do anything to improve his popularity with his brothers. In fact, it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. His brothers hatch a plan. They lure Joseph into the middle of nowhere, kill him, and throw his body down a well. But when a group of traders wanders by, they get a new idea. Rather than kill Joseph, they sell him to these traders as a slave and proceed to lie to their father and say that Joseph was killed by a wild animal. Joseph, meanwhile, is quickly resold. The traders pocket a profit by selling him off to the Egyptian pharaoh's chief of staff. And over the ensuing years, Joseph endures a lot of suffering. He's a slave in a foreign country. He gets wrongly accused of a crime, and then he's imprisoned. This all transpires over the course of 10 years or so. But then things start to turn around for Joseph. He's called in by the Pharaoh to help interpret some mysterious dreams. Joseph interprets the Pharaoh's dreams to mean that they'll have seven years of good harvest, followed by seven years of famine. And so they need to store up food now to prepare for the famine ahead. The Pharaoh places increasing trust in Joseph, eventually making him his right-hand man. When the famine Joseph predicted finally hits, People from all over the region flock to Egypt because of the rumors that they've got food. And guess who shows up looking for food? Joseph's brothers. Joseph knows it's them right away, but they don't recognize him. And so he decides to test them, to see if their hearts have changed or if they were still the same hateful brothers who sold him into slavery. Once Joseph is satisfied that they're remorseful for what they did to him and they've learned their lesson, he's ready to forgive them. They reunite and reconcile. Jacob and all his sons move to Egypt and live there in peace and prosperity for many years. It seems like a happy ending to Joseph's story, but it's not quite finished. There's a sort of epilogue, which is what we read from this morning. In the verses just before our reading starts, Jacob, the great patriarch of Israel, breathes his last. And when Jacob dies, the brothers are worried that Joseph will finally take revenge for what they did to him all those years ago. In other words, they seem to be concerned that Joseph had merely offered them a superficial forgiveness in order to make their father happy. But now that Jacob was gone, Joseph could really give them what was coming to them. However, Joseph responds not with a vengeful heart, but instead one full of profound faith. He says, you planned something bad for me, but God produced something good from it in order to save the lives of many people. Now, within the confines of the story, the meaning of Joseph's response seems pretty straightforward. He's saying to his brothers, you did something bad by plotting my murder and selling me off as a a slave. But God found a way to make good from that by bringing me into leadership in Egypt. And as a result, I was able to make preparations to store up grain and save thousands of people from dying of starvation. But the deeper question is, 
How do we understand these words from Joseph in theological terms? That is, what do they tell us about who God is and how God turns bad into good? It may be tempting to read this story or a verse like Romans 8.28, which again reads, Every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. To read those and conclude that God wills and causes everything that happens in the world. In other words, everything happens for a reason that only God understands. But that's not really a reformed reading of this story. For one, it trivializes the presence and power of sin in the world. And second, it distorts God's sovereignty and goodness by portraying God as a sort of puppet master that manipulates creation and causes suffering as a means of bringing about good. Instead, we can understand the evil in this story as human-generated. The brothers sold Joseph into slavery. That was their sin, their wrong turn, not God's plan. And yet, in spite of their sin and its dire consequences for Joseph, God is still able to produce good from it. God recalculates the route. That's right. Finally, back to the GPS, like I promised. Even though the brothers deviate from the route God has laid out for them, God will keep providing new routes back to God's final destination. This is how I understand Joseph's words. He's saying to his brothers, you took a wrong turn, but God recalculated the route. On its face, this is a story about death. It's about a family grieving in the wake of their father's death and the complicated family dynamics that often accompany that moment in a family's life together. And given what's going on in the world right now, it seems fitting that we're reading a story about death today. These past several months, it feels like we've been surrounded by it. Many of us have lost family members or close friends. Worldwide, we're approaching a million deaths from COVID. And in the U.S., we just passed the threshold of 200,000 Americans dead, with estimates projecting that number could double again by the end of the year. There have been nearly 600 murders in the city of Chicago this year. We're on pace to hit 1,000 fatal police shootings in this country for the third year in a row. And this week especially, I find myself grieving again the killing of Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, and feeling angry at the injustice and the lack of accountability. Then last Friday, the feminist icon and Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died after a battle with cancer. And earlier this week, we officially entered into fall, a season when leaves will fall from trees Frost will soon come, and plants will wither and die. And so again, I'll say, it seems fitting that we're reading a story today that centers on death. But really, this is a story of death and life. Listen to Joseph's words one more time. You planned something bad for me, but God produced something good from it in order to save the lives of many people. Even though both our individual sin and our systemic communal sin consistently, consistently leads us towards death and suffering, God is relentlessly leading us back towards life. We take wrong turns, and God recalculates our route. And when we approach Scripture with this lens of recalculation, we begin to see it everywhere. Not just in Joseph's story, but all over the witness of Scripture. Even in the most crucial story of our Christian faith. The story of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. 
Those who crucified Jesus planned something bad for him, but God produced something good from it in order to save the lives of many people, of all people. This is at the very core of our faith as Christians. The resurrection belief that in spite of all the suffering and death caused by our mistakes, our wrong turns, God is perpetually recalculating our route back towards life. The depth of suffering and death we're facing in our personal lives, our community, our country, and our world these days is painful. It's right to grieve it and to lament all the wrong turns we've made that have brought us here. And still, even as we confront death, like Joseph, let's continue to proclaim that God is leading us back to life. We die and we rise with Christ. So let's proclaim a faith that's rooted in both the crucifixion and the resurrection. Suffering the sting of death and confessing the sin that creates it, and yet keeping hope that God will keep recalculating our route, faithfully leading us back towards life now and always. Amen. Your power, speed.
Well, friends, I'm here at our comfortable table in the Doherty Room to offer our table talk for our life together today. I hope you've signed up for our weekly newsletter, which is the Parish Life virtual format on email. It comes every Friday evening. And I've got uh, a few highlights that I'd like to underscore. You can get more information on our website or through our Facebook page or our First Press community group. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that we've been in phase four of the Illinois Recovery Plan. And the session wonders how many of our members would like to experience worship in person. There will be a survey coming out. As with all things we try to do, we, we try to bring our very best to God, but it's important you read through what to expect. There will be face masks at all times. There will be no singing by the congregation. Uh, there will be a sermon delivered, prayers offered. We'll be able to speak calmly our unison prayers and affirmation. Everything will be carefully socially distanced and pre-registered. Read about that and then let us know if you are ready to commit to be a regular attender for that worship. We'll give you more news in the days ahead. A reminder for the women of our church that we've got our uh, women's retreat coming up in Adler Park uh, next Saturday. We've got uh, Lori Sunberg, Mary Slight, uh, and uh, Aaron, Reverend Aaron Sharp will all be providing some powerful insight into creating some sense of spiritual uh, vitality for you in these times. You can read more about that again on our website. And if you haven't signed up, let us know you're coming. Also, in mid-October, just get yourself ready. We're going to have some fun, another picnic in the parking lot, with a group that really has been inspired by our community witness. Uh, the uh, Kettle Band is going to be leading a wonderful time. Stay tuned for more detail about that. Well, there's our table talk for today. Now I invite you to hear a word uh, from our stewardship team talking about how we bring our first fruits Return to God, and uh, what a fine invitation into discipleship. I invite you to reflect upon your life and how you share your walk of faith day by day. Hi, I'm Carol Braunschweig. I'm a new member this year of the Stewardship Committee, and I've been asked to make a brief video about um, tithing and what it means to me. Uh, on my first meeting where we were discussing the role of tithing, um, one of the topics that was discussed is about why we certainly we love the tithing that people give um, obligatory when they're feeling as though they need to do this because they're a member and they're a responsible member of the church and so they want to give from that standpoint. Um, and that is very much appreciated. But what we really want to be sure is that, um, and what we're looking for from people, is to give from your heart. And I will say, um, this being my new entrance into sp uh, the Stewardship Committee, that kind of differentiation isn't really something I'd thought about. And I was um, thinking about that quite a bit after the meeting and thought, well, let me see what they have to say about this on the internet. And I came across a quote by Mother Teresa. And the quote is, um, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. And I thought, oh, that is exactly what they were getting at with this. And our love of God, giving as um, a part of your disposable income, giving to the church to do our, our spreading God's love and God's word through the church and within the community is, what we're really shooting for in when we ask people to tithe, to, to give, to donate. And that afternoon, um, and the, the next day, I was with two of my five grandchildren, two granddaughters, uh, seven and six years old. 
and I said, girls, I came across this message last night, this quote, and I, I think it's interesting. I want to hear your impression of it. And I, I said, you know, you can, you can uh, give without loving, but you can't love without giving. And the oldest one, Jojo, Josephine, said, well, Grandma, we know that. And I said, really? How, how do you know that? And they said, well, she said, love isn't love till you give it away. And I just laughed because, of course, those are the famous lines um, from a Sound of Music song, which I have spent hours watching with these two granddaughters as well as my other uh, grandchildren. And I thought, how beautiful they really do get it and they get a message um, much better put than I could do here. I'm, I'm hoping that some of what I'm saying is reaching you at a level that helps expand your spiritual giving. And um, those are my thoughts for today. Thank you.
siblings in Christ, I invite you to pray with me. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers may serve your will and show your steadfast love. We pray for the world you have made, that evil powers would be overthrown and that wrongs would be righted, that those who hunger and thirst for justice would be fed and satisfied, so that all your children may freely enjoy your creation. We too pray for your creation, which you call good. Protect those in the paths of the wildfires, those enduring impossible heat, as well as those in this season threatened by hurricanes and tropical storms. In a time of changing climate and intensifying weather, protect those most vulnerable to their effects, even as we summon the will to conserve what you task us with safeguarding. O oh God, whom we cannot love unless we love our neighbors, remove from our hearts the disdain that belittles your children with whom we disagree. Grow understanding among us as neighbors and strangers, young and aged, demonstrators and counter-demonstrators across races, genders, classes, and ethnicities that we may have a true experience of one another's humanity in all its glory and all its wreckage. Help us to honor difference and pursue unity with equal vigor. And mighty God, sovereign over the nations, direct those who make, enforce, and judge our laws, our president and all our elected and appointed officials, our governors, our mayors, our school, school boards, our town councils. May our leaders be guided by your wisdom and may they lead in a way of righteousness that equity and honesty and integrity would be lifted up in their lives and in our common lives. Merciful God, you bear the pain of the world and there is plenty of it today. Look with compassion on those who are sick. Visit them with healing as a sign of your grace. Lend your depth of insight and wisdom to doctors and scientists and researchers working hard on a coronavirus vaccine, that the virus would abate and that everyone affected by it would be rescued in body, mind, and spirit and stand today with those who sorrow, those who have lost someone dear to them, to age or illness or violence or natural disaster. Visit the grieving with that most powerful assurance that neither death nor life nor things present, nor things to come, nor pestilence, nor gun, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray, praying as he taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Remember that we are a resurrection people, seeking hope, seeking God's presence and God's leading towards life even when we're confronted with death. Being resurrection people doesn't mean acting as if we're unfazed by death. Instead, it means that when we find ourselves, our church, our community, our country on the wrong roads, roads that lead towards death, that we constantly seek out God's recalculated route with a deep and abiding faith that God will keep leading us towards life if we simply choose to follow. So even in the midst of all the suffering and death we face at this moment, let's choose to be resurrection people. And now hear the blessing. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and may God be gracious to you this day and each day forevermore. Amen.